For the last few episodes, Bobby and Pam's relationship has hung precariously in the balance, with her rightly blaming JR for Cliff's downfall, and Bobby getting tired of her consistent blind spot to Cliff's foibles. One little push could send them over the edge and ruin their marriage forever, or be the momentum they need to bounce back and reconcile. Call Girl is that push. Bobby and JR enjoy a brotherly game of the ancient 1980s sport of racquetball. JR brings up Pamela, which is still a tense subject since Bobby also blames JR for chasing Pamela away. Do wonders for that state of celibacy been in since your wife walked out on you. Driven out, it's more like. Bobby wins, of course, but gets called away by Ray Krebs before he can get a second helping of JR's ass. Ray is upset about some apparent rustlers breaking into South Fork and lifting some of the cattle. Detective Bobby thinks it's just a few two-bit rustlers, so he and Ray plan to go into town and do some asking at the local bars. Bobby, you're an adult. If you want to go to the bar, just say so. Pamela is doing fine in her job, but the women around her can't understand why she doesn't just strike out on her own since Bobby seems to be a bit of a pill. This even extends to Leanne, one of the store's fashion models, played by Veronica Hamill. Pam and Leanne strike up a friendship, and Leanne extends the offer to be roomies. Pam thinks that might make the split feel too permanent, but she agrees to a trial run. Meanwhile, the cartel is hesitant to do business with JR because Cliff Barnes in the Office of Land Management has him all bottled up. Willie Joe and Jeff stuck with you. Look what happened to them. Chuck thinks that JR should bring in some new independent oil men who will be loyal. JR meets with Ben Maxwell, the man who brokered the deal to install Cliff in the OLM in the first place. Ben rebuffs JR's attempts to convince him to rein Cliff in, but becomes distracted by Leanne and Pamela across the room. JR introduces them and takes notice of Ben's immediate attraction to Leanne. JR shows up at Leanne's apartment and reveals that he knew her when she was a high-end call girl named Amber. He tries to bribe her into one more big score with Ben Maxwell, but she's not having it. When that doesn't work, he threatens to have Leanne's daughter taken away from her. He even goes so far as to have his cop friend roust her. Sue Ellen, complete with her own personal theme, is working on a bottle of whiskey when JR comes in and threatens her too. You take care of that baby here. Could it the only thing standing between you and the gutter? I guess he rolled a 20 in intimidation for this campaign. Detectives Ewing and Krebs hit up another cowboy bar while trying to find the identity of those rustlers. How many of these places you think we've been in tonight? Can Bobby really not count to six? The investigation is a bust, but they spot local rich kid Kip Mainwaring running afoul of some good old boys. This leads into a big time cowboy scrum. Turns out Kit and Bobby were looking for the same thing. What was Mainwaring Oil doing in a joint like that in the first place? I don't know, maybe the same thing Ewing Oil was doing, huh? A big enough stick and a big enough carrot finally convinced Leanne to double cross Pamela. The next morning, Bobby tells everyone else about the fight and the investigation. Jock is frustrated at having to experience a fist fight vicariously in a funny moment. Ray and I got to fight with a couple boys in the bar last night. Ah, uh, damn, wish I'd been with you. Kit swings by so they can speak to the sheriff, and Lucy takes an immediate shine to him. She asks Miss Ellie to invite the Mainwarings the next time that there's a party, and Jock also likes that idea if the Ewings and Mainwarings can get together in business. Leanne asks Ben to come up for a nightcap and gets him drunk. She shows him into bed with Pamela while the sleazy photographer outside shoots the scandalous photos. The Tawtry story is a scandal in the paper the next day, triggering a conversation about Ben Maxwell. Sue Ellen quickly figures out what's going on. Well, wasn't he the man to put Cliff Barnes into the OLM? That's the rumor. I never could have been it down. Bobby also figures it out immediately and lays into JR. Jock pulls him apart and promises to do worse if he finds Bobby's right. Leanne apologizes to Pam for double-crossing her and clears out of the apartment. For yourself. I didn't know it would be in the papers. Pam also plans to clear out of Dallas, but Bobby stops her and says that running will only confirm that she's guilty. If she comes back, though, she'll be showing that she trusts the people who love her, and she'll be sticking it to JR. To JR's surprise, the rest of the cartel is still nonplussed. After all, Cliff Barnes is still head of the OLM, with or without Maxwell. They leave him to stew in his own failure and frustration, and as if rejection by the cartel isn't bad enough, Pam is back at South Fork for good. Call Girl is less an episode unto itself than it is a bridge to the last few episodes of season two. Jock's masculinity, the Julie business, Cliff being a Ewing punching bag, and the Pamby conflagration are in the rear view now, and we're moving towards the Ewings getting desperate to get out from under Cliff's thumb, and the implications of that plotting. 
Sue Ellen is descending from an inspired woman asserting her independence to a sloppy drunk, and it's a race against time to see if she'll deliver the baby before doing permanent damage to herself and the child. While Call Girl is ultimately inconsequential, it does shade in the lines of how the Dallas world works. Again, we stick with the major theme of the season, with desperate people being motivated to do things they don't want to do for money. But we also get the flip side of that coin. With JR's threats being made real in the form of his police lackeys. What do you want? You, you're under arrest. What are you talking about? For what? Solicitor. You... Maybe I'll just add assault and an officer to that. That's something that's hardly groundbreaking, but it does let the viewer see the implications for JR's relationship with Sue Ellen should she try to make a run for it. Pam and Bobby are finally back together on South Fork, and that's a relief. Not because I'm interested in their relationship, but because our long national nightmare is over. I understand the impetus to introduce some drama into their otherwise perfect marriage, but it became clear early on that the writers just weren't sure how to do that. The result was the same conversation recycled several times, something that hits differently if you're binging the show rather than watching it as it aired. JR's failed attempt at breaking them up chalks up another mark in the loss column over the past few episodes, but those who like to see JR get a comeuppance this would normally be a joyous time, but we've covered before how much of a malignant narcissist he is. The problem with that is, when narcissists lose, they tend to focus their ire on those whom they can control. Here's a hint. The worse things get for JR, the worse things get for Sue Ellen. But that's something that will play out over the rest of the season. This episode is all about the guest stars. The gorgeous Veronica Hamill stops in for a single episode to play Leanne, Pamela's newfound friend. Hamill is a model-turned-actress who made her screen debut in the Jane Fonda classic Clute before settling into television. She's probably best remembered as Joyce Davenport on Hill Street Blues, a role for which she was nominated for five Emmy Awards. Also making a guest appearance is Claude Earl Jones as Sergeant Matt Henderson, JR's Vice Squad lackey. Jones was a fixture in television around this time, making a big turn in the excellent made-for-TV horror movie Dark Knight of the Scarecrow. He would return to Dallas several times playing different characters, a time when you could still do that kind of thing without the fandom ripping you apart for continuity issues. Speaking of recurring actors playing different roles, that's Larry Hagman's daughter Heidi as the Hell Spa receptionist. She'd have another guest spot again playing a receptionist before season's end. Call Girl is a fine but unremarkable episode that finally wraps up some of the story threads so that we can get on with the final arc of the season. You remember when there was that unpleasantness with Wash Sup Pen's little girl, don't you, Kurt? How could I forget what you've done for me? How old is your poppy now? She just turned 15 last month. Child has to be 16 to be legal. Let's forget about poppy. You got something else for you now. I got this friend of mine coming in tomorrow on the 542 out of Columbia, and I was hoping you could pick him up for me. Wash Sup Pen. The fellow was taking liberties with my daughter. Turned out it was the wrong man, though. I want him gone. I guess it's time for a father to do what he's got to do. Everybody deserves a second chance.